Welcome to episode number 179 of CXO Talk. I'm Michael Krigsman, and today's show, we're going to be talking about transition and change, the impact on business and technology in a large traditional manufacturing organization. My guest today is Roddy McCaig, who is the Chief Information Officer of Shaw Industries. Roddy, how are you today? Good afternoon. Good to be with you, Michael. Well, thank you so much. And I especially want to thank NetSuite, who is sponsoring this episode. Roddy, tell us about Shaw Industries. What do you do? How big is the company? How long have you been in business? How long have you been working there? So give us some background and context. Okay. Shaw Industries is a 50-year-old company. We are a complete flooring provider, uh, both hard surface products and soft surface products. Um, and then uh, custom-made rugs is, is the other soft area that we're in. So, Roddy, tell us about the changes that have taken place in the industry and what has the impact been on Shaw? Well, the industry has been through a lot of changes for, for some years now. Uh, started back in the 80s with consolidation when most of the flooring in this country was uh, broadloom carpet and then on the residential side carpet tile. Uh, a lot of mergers and acquisitions through the 80s and 90s. Uh, today, there's probably, there's just a handful of, of companies that are in the broadloom carpet business and there's two major ones, uh, Shaw being one of them. Um, then in the late 90s, hard surface products started coming uh, more of a preference. And uh, that trend is continuing even today, probably picked up a little bit of pace. So you've seen all the big players, uh, including Shaw, transitioning a lot of their capacity in the manufacturing areas uh, to hard surface products. Uh, carpet still is dominates our business. We're the largest carpet manufacturer in the world, uh, largest carpet tile manufacturer in North America. And, uh, but hard surface is definitely an area that is uh, gaining more and more preference from the consumers. And uh, a lot of creativity and a lot of design improvements over the last several years in that area. And we expect that trend is going to continue to uh, increase as we go forward. So this major change has taken place uh, among consumers, their expectations of you. And so what are the, what are, what have the implications been on Shaw from a business standpoint and therefore from a technology perspective with you as the CIO? Well, a lot of changes were heightened during the recession in 2008 when the big recession hit it, it, uh, any of your listeners listen to the news, you know what it did to housing. And housing is a huge part of the, of the flooring business. So it had a dramatic impact on uh, Shaw and our competitors. But the, we've seen consumer taste change. Uh, one of the things, they went to cheaper products during that time. Uh, a lot more PET-based products were sold, uh, which is a cheaper uh, material. Uh, you probably don't get the uh, quality and and endurance that you get out of some other type products, but uh, we've seen that trend. And Shaw, just like most providers, you've got to sell what the customer wants to buy. So we went through some transitions there in our plants and capacity to make certain kinds of products and reduce other kinds of products. Uh, so that has changed a lot. And we've seen, you know, over the years, you've seen the Amazon.coms of the world really picking up steam and more Every year you hear about how much more Christmas shop is done online. Well, that's finally starting to get into our industry. Uh, you're not seeing huge sales on the internet yet, but you're seeing huge marketing efforts and you're seeing consumers just like buying a new car. Most people do a lot of their shopping online before they go to the store to actually make the, the sale. And by the time they go in, they know pretty much what they want. So we're having to cater to that change in consumer trends and one thing we're trying to learn more about consumers and what their preferences are and what they're going to be wanting in the future. And what are, what are the implications for the, the culture inside the company? What are the implications for, as CIO, what you're doing with technology as a result of these 
changing expectations and changing uh, consumers changing how they how they shop. Right. Well, you know, uh, at Shaw, technology has one purpose, and that's to serve a business need. And as consumers want to shop more online, then we've got to be in a in a position where we can provide them what they need to see online to make them want to go to a store and buy our products. That a lot of that will be more detailed imaging of our products so that they can get a very good feel for what that product would look like. Uh, when you're buying flooring, especially carpet, the one thing you can't get there is the touch because everybody wants to feel that soft product. But as, as far as we can go with giving them clear uh, images of the products, all the specs of the products, what they can expect when they, when they go pick that product up and have it put in their floor. So all our web marketing is very, very important. Uh, we have to cater more to being to our, our customers who sell to consumers, they need us to do more to support their sales to that consumer too, especially in some of the online. Uh, we're seeing a little bit more of the business of the hard surface product, the palletized goods can be sold easier online, especially hard surfaces. And our customers need us to be able to support their consumers with samples or whatever they may need to close out their sales. So we've been doing a lot of work over the last year on preparing to support that part of our business better too. So there is, it seems from what you're describing, there is a, a kind of two parts to this. There is the business changing and then there's the technology to support that. The business changing, uh, changing its understanding of what consumers want and adapting itself along with the technology changes at the same time. Yeah, there is. And, and we have to support the business in that, you know, with the way the world is today, de depending on technology, whatever our business needs to do, that probably dictates that we're going to have to do something with the technology to support that business change. And, and we're seeing a lot of that, uh, you know, just we, we now have people in the company whose sole job is to understand and learn more about consumers. Uh, used to, we didn't worry about that. We just sold to the retailers and they worried about the consumers. But if you think about our business and, and we have thousands of very small customers around the country that have very small flooring uh, stores and they do not have the manpower or the know-how to provide all this technology to the consumers. So it's really come back to the manufacturers are gonna to have to do that. And Shaw is stepping up and really pressing that, trying to get better at that and to provide their customers, our customers' customers, what they need to get them into those stores to buy our products. So you're the manufacturer and then you have thousands of stores through which you sell. And so you have to, so you're considering but the needs of both your customers, the stores, as well as the end buyer. Absolutely. You know, we feel like the more we know about the consumer, the better we can market to them, but we can help our customers market to them also. And we're even going to the point of helping our customers with technology in their stores or web presence to support their, their individual retail stores. So all that helps us too. It, the more, the better job our customers can do selling to the consumers, the better job we're doing for the overall company then. So there's, a, so there's this shift among consumers in terms of how they want to buy, which, is, which has forced your customers, the, the thousands of stores, to adapt and change. And as the kind of big fish behind the scenes, you're helping them through that transition. And, and it's exactly a, it's a, right. And, and a lot of it is, you know, they just don't have the manpower or the know how to do it. A lot of them have no technology expertise on staff at all. And, uh, you know, we have to help them because our success depends on their success. So we're, we're actively in several ways out there trying to support them and trying to give them better digital marketing and materials to, for their websites and to support them all we can to, to be a better retailer to the consumers. So that's on the marketing side, but when you talk, are, are the people viewing may not realize that when you talk about hard versus soft flooring, you're talking about goods that are palletized, 
versus, let's say, carpets and rolls. And so maybe can yeah. you explain that distinction? And then let's talk about the implications on manufacturing. Well, when a typical uh, roll of carpet comes out of a plant, it'll be 12 foot wide and it'll be somewhere between 125 to 150 foot long. And that could end up being sold to 10 or 12 customers, or it may go to one customer, depending on what their orders are. Uh, so it is a long roll, 12 foot wide carpet for the most part, that's cut up into room size pieces and then installed around houses around the US. Uh, palletized goods, all the hard surface products for the most part, whether it's wood, laminate, luxury vinyl tile, or tile and stone is palletized because they come in either strips or, or tiles, square tiles or rectangle tiles, and they're boxed and palletized, and they can be shipped a lot easier. And, and you, as far as the plants, there's no, no comparison whatsoever. A plant that makes carpet cannot make carpet tile, and a plant that makes carpet tile cannot make hard surface. It takes totally different manufacturing equipment and processes and systems to support those environments. So, you know, it, it's a matter if, if you have a shift in demand between carpet and hard surfaces, you're looking at the potential for slowing down the carpet capacity and growing the, the hard surface capacity. And we've been through a lot of that over the years too. We have to shift our demand or shift the, the capacity in our plants to meet the demand that's coming in. And, you know, we have to sell the products that the consumers are wanting. So we're constantly adjusting our capacities within our plants to manufacture what we need for sales. Okay, so, so you are changing your manufacturing mix based on the demand that comes in. And at the same time, though, you need to be increasingly agile, adaptable in terms of your ability to do this quickly. And I'm assuming that the recession that hit in 2008 must have had a big impact as well. So how do you do that? And maybe talk us through some of the technologies that enable you to adapt and change uh, in ways that in the past you didn't have to. Well, part of the... Uh part of the story is you, you've got to plan ahead. You know, you don't start up a new plant. We're in the process right now of building three new plants uh, for various product lines. And that's not something you do in a few weeks or a few months. You've got to predict where your business is going to be a couple years ahead of time, because it's at best, it's probably going to take you about a year to get that plant built and get all the equipment ordered and installed and up and running. So it, it's, Predicting where your future is going to be is critical when you're talking about making that kind of changes in your capacities. Uh, so, you know, once you get a set of technology set up for a new type plant, we, we're building right now our first luxury vinyl tile plant, and we have developed uh, modified systems to handle all that. And in some cases, we have new systems that handles that new product category. Once we get that, opening up another one won't be nearly as uh, time consuming on our part, on the technology part, as it will on the people who are building a plant and installing the equipment in it. So the key part, the critical path of any new capacity like that is what kind of manufacturing equipment you need. Because the odds are I can get technology in a lot quicker than they can get manufacturing equipment ordered uh, from a supplier and, and on site and installed. And I know you're using automation, you're using sensors, you, you have a lot of advanced technology in your plant. We do. Uh, we spent a lot of years uh, both in manufacturing and distribution. Uh, we have a very big distribution process. We have a, a regional DCs all around the country where we will ship products from, um, from Dalton to those uh, locations and then they will deliver it from there to our customers, uh, all shall own. Uh, all our distribution centers are highly automated with conveyor belts and all the lift trucks have computers on them that are computer driven. And when they go pick up a, a roll of carpet and drop it off, we tell them where to go to get the next product to move it. So all that automation is there. Uh, manufacturing is the same way. We, we spend a lot of money on automating our plants. You know, there's, there's three things that we find very, very important to our company. And one's our service. We pride ourselves on providing the best service in the, in the industry. Uh, the second one is quality. Uh, there again, we pride ourselves on selling the very best products that we possibly can and the, some of the best in the industry. And then the cost. 
the lower we can keep our costs, the better it is for our customers and then ultimately the consumers. So automation helps us in all three of those areas in manufacturing distribution to in, in make sure that we're getting the best value out of our products and the best quality out of our products. So all that automation, it either reduces labor or we, we have automation on our manufacturing lines that are constantly checking temperatures where temperature is critical, uh, checking moisture rates where moisture is uh, critical, checking the speed of the lines. Uh, all our product specifications says how fast the, the computer or the machinery ought to be running, how, what the temperatures ought to be and all that. And we have sensors that will alert people if those get out of uh, sync on where they should be because if they do, you run the risk of starting to have poverty problems. And when you've got a, a big manufacturing line running carpet at a very high rate of speed, you can produce a lot of off quality real quick like that. So sensors and, and knowing what the is going on in the actual manufacturing equipment is very, very important to us and our quality. So Shaw is a is a is an old company. It's been around for a long time. Fifty years. Say again? Fifty years. So, so it's a four-point billion dollar company. It's been around for 50 years, and that means that the company has gone through many changes with historical traditional processes. So as you've been going through this shift, uh, building automation in, uh, shifting to the cloud, which we're going to talk more about in a, in a few minutes, what have, the, what have the workforce implications been? What have the cultural implications been? How did you, what were some of the challenges that you faced in making these transitions and how did you overcome these challenges? How did you address them? It, it, it's, uh, it's been interesting. You know, I, we often talk about years ago uh, in our industry when you wanted to put in some automation, uh, most of our users in the plants and the DCs were, were afraid of it. They didn't want automation because they didn't know anything about it. Well, the new generations love automation. So today, you know, they're constantly, they're ready for the new automation or, or whatever technology you want to provide them. So that, that culture has changed a whole lot. And I, I think it's just due to the way our country has gone and, and fell in love with automation from the time, technology from the time kids are old enough to reach a computer mouse or whatever. But the trend has changed a whole lot. Uh, we have a lot of people that will help us now with technology ideas. We're used to, we had to come up with all those ideas and, and we've made tremendous progress with, with the people in the plants and the people in the distribution centers. Now, one challenge, you know, we talk about jobs in this country and everything, but it, sometimes it's hard not only to find technology uh, uh, people to work in our technology group, but even in our operations. Uh, it's hard to keep a full staff sometimes. And with the auto automation that is going into our plants and into our distribution centers, that, that workforce needs to be better educated. They got to have technical skills and be, be able to use computers and be able to use uh, lift trucks that are automated and to read sensor readouts and that sort of thing. So. We have to have a, a higher degree of education. Now, I'm not saying it takes a college education, but we're looking for more educated people as every year goes past because we got more and more automation out there that their jobs uh, include that they will have to know how to use certain technologies. And, and sometimes that can be a challenge on finding enough of those kind of resources. Uh, we, we're always, just about always hiring and, and got openings in our operations where we need more people. So that, that's a little bit of a challenge. You know, as you implement more and more technology, your workforce has got to grow to be able to take advantage of that technology. And, and we have things that we do as a company to try to support the colleges, local colleges, and the, even high schools, uh, encouraging the kids to get more of a technical education so they'll be ready for the jobs when they come out of the school into the workforce. What about the impact on IT inside IT? Because as you, because I'm sure that the skill sets have changed, uh, both the type of equipment as well as as you've moved to the cloud. Yeah, I mean we've seen just dramatic changes. I've been here a little over 20 years, and we've seen dramatic changes in in the technology we use. Uh, but for the most part, the people who go into the technology field and go to college to study technology love that. 
they love the next new thing. So it's not as much a challenge for the technology people to learn the next thing that we're going to be using in manufacturing or distribution or, or even inside the offices here at Shaw. Uh, but they usually are excited about the next big thing coming in and, and eager to get their hands on it and learn it. So it's not as big a challenge. You know, sometimes finding resources, uh, there again, I think, uh, most people who are involved with technology around this country know that it's getting harder and harder to find technology resources too. There's such a demand and a lot of it is what I was just talking about. More and more companies are putting more and more technology out there and as you do that you've got to have more technology savvy people in the workforce and that's becoming more and more of a challenge I think for the colleges and universities around the country. What about the, just the overall impact on IT of, how has IT changed over the last, uh, call it 10 years, say, for example? Well, I think a lot of it, uh, several ways. One that we talk about a lot is the type person who is in IT. I remember the day when a, a technology person was somebody that was in the back room and, and they just did the stuff and sent it out and people started using it, but today, most of our technology people are out in the business. They're out in the plants, they're out in the, the office buildings, they're out in the distribution centers working with the users hand in hand on putting in the new automation or fixing the new automation or upgrading the new automation. So people skills are a big part of what we do today. And 20 years ago, you didn't worry too much about that unless you was a manager or something. Uh, so that's been a drastic change. Uh, we have a lot more top technology that we have to take care of today. Uh, very different mix than we had 20 years ago and most companies that I know of. Uh, there's so much more technology, the high speed networks, the internet, uh, communications is critical, wireless everywhere in every facility. So just a lot more responsibility. And today the technology can very easily bring a company to its knees if everything's not working correctly. So it's a lot more pressure, I think, and, and a lot more responsibility on technology groups, I think, and probably in just about every company. Let's talk about the cloud. It's, uh, you're, you're a large company, again, four and a half billion dollars in revenue. You're owned by Berkshire Hathaway. And so tell us about what you're doing with the cloud, which I know is quite, quite significant. It's growing. Uh, you know, most of our systems we host in our data center where, where they've been for probably close to 30 years now. Uh, we're a very customized uh, operation. Uh, historically, ERP systems have not uh, catered to the carpet business in particular. It's a very unique inventory and, and uh, they just could not handle the inventory systems that we needed. So over the years, we have built a, a set of customized systems that do specifically what our industry needs. Uh, over the last few years, we have started using the cloud options where it makes sense. To us, uh, cloud is another option. It's another tool. Uh, it's not a destination that we're striving to get to, but it's also not a destination that we're afraid to embrace. Uh, we always look for what solution do we need for the business that will provide the best service at the best cost. And if that's hosted in our data center here in Georgia, that's fine. Or if it's in the cloud with one of our service pro providers, that's fine too. Uh, we do have a number of things in the cloud now. One of our first big moves was we moved to Google, Mail, and Docs uh, probably about uh, three, three and a half years ago. And I've uh, been very successful for us. Uh, we have nothing on our Mail or Docs here in our data center anymore. It's all in Google's uh, Google's environment. Uh, when we started an international expansion about three years ago, uh, I knew we were going to need a different set of systems for that because our customized systems here were developed strictly for the US dollar and the English language. And we, we had a, a company-wide initiative that we were going to be focused on international expansion around the world. So I knew we was going to have to have a different solution. And after a careful search, we chose a, a company called NetSuite to use their ERP for everything outside of North America as far as our ERP system goes. That is 100% uh, cloud-based SaaS, true SaaS system that's hosted in the cloud. Uh, so we're running operations in China. We're running operations in Australia. 
and we're uh, running all uh, operations about to go into Euro, and all those are hosted in the cloud on the NetSuite system in the US, and uh, been very successful with that. Uh, we use Concur, which a lot of companies do for expense management, that's in the cloud. BigSalesforce.com uh, to sort our Salesforce, uh, that's all in the cloud, and have a couple of uh, apps from HR that's hosted in the cloud also. So, why do you like the cloud? Well, I wouldn't say I like it, but I'm not afraid of it. And <laughs> it, it, it is, you know, being a creature of habit, if it's all in my data center, I have complete control. But the cloud vendors, the, the best cloud vendors have gotten very good at this. And what it make, lets you do is take our international uh, expansion, for instance. If we hadn't went cloud, then I would have been looking at putting software and hardware and people in every country we go in. And we're all over Asia, we're in Australia, we're in South America, about to go in Europe. And that would have been a huge undertaking to put hardware, software, and staff locations to take care of that hardware and software in all the countries we're in and all the countries we're going into. By going to the cloud with NetSuite, you know, I don't have to do any of that. I just bring up a, another subsidiary within NetSuite uh, set up the languages that I need and the currency that I need and any localization rules that I need and I'm up and running. So it, it, instead of being up to a year event to go in a new country, you know, just in a two or three months, we can, we can be live in another country now. So that's one reason I like the cloud for that area because it's very flexible. Uh, it's very quick to get, once you get the original uh, installs done, it's very quick to add and expand on it then. So that's one reason we like it a lot for that part of our business. So do you, cr have you created a, a, shall we say, a kind of a template that you use uh, to roll out new offices or, or new countries? Well, we have, we have processes and a roadmap we use, but with, with NetSuite, you know, everything runs off the same instance. It's not like you're bringing up another version or another server. We just plug in more data and more rules and it just adds to the existing instance. So everything we're running on that suite runs on one instance. It, you know, a lot, of, a lot of software companies, if you go with a traditional system, everywhere you go, you have another version of it. That's not the case with the cloud, a true SaaS app. You have one version and you just set up new rules for what you want the language preferences or the currency or whatever the case may be and you're up and running. So it's very quick compared to the old way of doing it and, and getting a new location up and, and in business. So it sounds like your interest in cloud is a combination of uh, cost and ease. I'm sure there are also staffing implications. You don't have to buy, as you said, you don't have to buy the equipment. You don't have to send people over there. So it sounds like it's a combination of all of those things. There again, that's cost. Absolutely. Speed is, is important to us. Uh, and, and then service, you know, I don't even like to talk about service because we demand great service from all our providers. And if, if they don't provide the service then they're not an option whatsoever, it don't matter how much it costs if you got poor service. So we, we assume service when we go with a cloud, uh, supplier or any supplier really. So it's all about speed and cost with us and, and what's the best solution for our business. What about security? I've spoken with CIOs at much smaller companies than yours who have made the argument, well, we're nervous to go to the cloud because we want to have the control and we're going to manage, we're going to manage all of that ourselves. So what, what, do you, what about that argument? Well, you know, I can understand that, but, but you've got to keep in mind, I think a lot of it depends on who your cloud partner is. I would wager to bet that there's probably not too many countries in the world that has better security and more security expertise and people than Google. Uh, you'd be hard pressed to be a better secure site than Google can provide just because of their manpower and expertise and money that they put into that because it's critical to their reputation. Uh, NetSuite is, is the same way. They're very, very good. We vetted them very strongly before we went with them because that, that to be honest, that was one of our early concerns too. And I think you can, it is a valid concern if you don't pick your partners carefully. Uh, you can get in a mess because if your cloud partner is not got all the tools
tools and expertise they need to secure your, your data, your equipment, then you are at risk. But I would wager also to bet that there's a lot of companies around this country that are not as secure as they think they are. Uh, you know, hackers could get in just about anywhere. And if you listen to news, some of the places I got into, n nowhere is bulletproof. But I do think that the cloud providers have gotten much, much better over this in this in the last few years. And the big players, the, the true SaaS suppliers like Google, like NetSuite, are very, very good at it. And I'm, we've grown to trust them completely. So you feel that the major cloud providers can do a better job with security and securing your data than you can? I think so. I think so because they have more resources and, and more uh, people expertise to do it. Um, and you take, I, I don't know how many customers Google got. NetSuite's got over 30,000 customers. Google's got more than that, I'm sure. Uh, when you've got that much and that much responsibility, you're going to be the best you can possibly be. And, and we vetted both of them uh, very closely on security before we went with them. And we were very, very comfortable with the, where they are and where they're going. So you're, a, you're owned now by Berkshire Hathaway. And as, as you were choosing your software, your cloud software, uh, was there interaction with the folks from Berkshire Hathaway? Did they have a view on, on cloud at all? Not really. Uh, you know, the stories you hear about Berkshire Hathaway is pretty much true. Uh, you know, Mr. Buffett always says he wants to buy good companies that are managed well and leave them alone. And that's pretty much what they have done. Uh, they do not uh, intercede or interfere uh, with operations of our company uh, whatsoever. They do offer advantages sometimes with volume discounts or whatever, but uh, no, we, as far as technology decisions and things like that, uh, it, it's up to us as a company, what we think is best for our company. Now they will, they do audit us uh, like they do all the other com Berkshire companies quite often. And uh, that's good because that helps us get stronger and better. Uh, but uh, we'll go through probably three or four audits a year from something from Berkshire Hathaway's auditors and that's, that's all good. But no, they do not uh, dictate or, or tell us what technology we should or shouldn't use. Uh, now, if we were going to do something really out on the edge or something, we would probably uh, feel obligated to make sure they were okay with it. But we've never had, we, we don't do that anyway. So uh, they, they let us run the company the way we've always run it and doing what we think is best for Shaw. And they don't uh, claim to know what's best for all the companies they own. And they, they, they look to us to make those decisions. So I, I think this is, people are interested in this. I, I certainly am. So Berkshire and Warren Buffett, they're, it sounds like they're pretty, pretty much the way they present themselves on, on the news, on television. Well, we, we found nothing but that to be the truth. Uh, you know, it, it's, um, Warren Buffett has been here a few times and, and spoke to our uh, management team and He's no different than, than the image that you read about and see about on the news. Uh, he, he's just that person. And uh, he runs a company and all the companies they own, just like he says he does. He, he buys good companies and leaves them alone. And as long as they're doing a good job on running them, he does not interfere with it. And uh, he lets them make the decisions because he feels like they're closer to the business and they make the right decisions. And uh, fortunately, our management team has always done that show so it, it his image is real real as far as we're concerned so he comes across in person as he does on the news or what have you absolutely 100 percent, no different so are there getting getting back to the cloud um are there sections of parts of your business of your data that you would be hesitant or reluctant to put into the cloud for any particular reason we're more comfortable with that today than we were five years ago or three years ago. Um, you know, there again, I think the key is, is picking the right partners and, and somebody you feel, really feel good about and can trust. But uh, as time goes on, we've, we've put more and more of our data in the cloud and we don't have it all up there today because we don't have a business reason to do it. But as business reasons come up to move more data, I will not be hesitant to do that. And like I said, as long as we feel good about the partner, we're going to entrust to take care of that data. 
So for you, the issue with moving to the cloud has to do with business case, given the, the equipment, the software, the manpower, and so forth that you have. Uh, it has nothing to do with concerns about security. And so therefore, as you said, really what it comes down to is do you trust the, the cloud vendor, the cloud supplier? Yeah, as far as, you know, we run the bulk of our work in our data center, but that's because we've had it there for 30 years. We built our systems exactly the way we want them. We have all the expertise to take care of our networks and hardware and software on staff. And once you get that environment built, it you got to have a good reason, financial reason to dismantle that because it costs you money to go a drastically different way. And we peeled off pieces of it over the years, but the bulk of it's still here because we have no reason to move it. Uh, it would take a business reason of, of pretty good magnitude to financially justify that kind of change. Now, if it comes up, we will address it and, and we will embrace it. But uh, I'm not against that, but from a service and financial viewpoint right now, it just makes all the sense in the world for us to keep the environment we got because it works very, very well. It's already highly depreciated and it's paid for itself many times over. And we don't, we don't have a business reason to dismantle it at this point in time. But you did have a business reason on the international side. So, so again, in this context, can you just summarize why, why did you decide to do it with international, whereas domestic, you're, you're staying on premise with your, your existing systems? Well, if you think about it, historically, you know, high 90s percent of everything we did was in North America. Uh, we did a little bit of business overseas, but it was strictly export. When we announced we were going into international expansion and one of the first big moves was to build a carpet manufacturing plant in Nantong, China, I knew we had to have another system because our systems wouldn't handle Chinese language and, and the Chinese currency and all the localization rules that the Chinese government has. So we did not have any option. Enhancing our systems to handle all that wasn't an option. We could not have got it done in anywhere close to the time frame that we were going to need it in. So I knew we had to have a, a different solution. And to be honest with you, I really wanted a cloud option because I did not want to have people everywhere we were going around the world. And luckily, I, at that point, I had never really heard of NetSuite other than one thing. We had bought a little company probably about 11 years ago in Australia that used a product called NetSuite. And I was not even familiar with it, but they loved it. So when the China deal come up, I called them back and, and they said, yeah, we still use it. You're not going to take it away from us, are you? And I said, no, we, we want to look at it a little closer, actually. So that's the only reason we actually knew about it uh, when we chose NetSuite. But they were the only true cloud SaaS option that we had on the table. You know, you had Oracle, you had SAP, you had JD Edwards, Microsoft, but none of them were true SaaS. And when NetSuite won out functionality and price over the others, then I got the SaaS as a byproduct of that, which I was pleased with. We have just a few minutes left. And so what advice do you have for companies who are undergoing the kind of change that your industry has undertaken and that, that the company has undertaken? Well, I would say probably uh, the sooner you start looking out in the future, the better you'll be. Uh, strategic planning and thinking about your future is critical because it gives you more time to adjust and, and to make your plans to get where you need to go. Uh, technology is changing very rapidly, and I don't think that's going to slow down. I think we're only going to see that continue to accelerate. Uh, the, the more you can get out in front of what your company needs and get your plans and thoughts gathered and ready, the better off you'll be. I, I would uh, advise to be open-minded. Uh, don't, turn, don't turn your back on the cloud because I, I do believe we're going to continue to see the transition to the cloud in all areas of technology. Uh, a lot of it is just going to be the, the timeliness, the cost, and the, and the staffing. You know, technology resources are getting harder and harder to find. Uh, if I was starting a, a company from scratch today, I would look 100% cloud. I would not even look at anything on, on premise. Uh, I would suggest that, that people think long term as you're acting short term. You know, you got to keep up with the day to day business, but keep your 
mind and your thoughts on what you need long term to support your company. And as you any technology that you're considering, but especially cloud, I would advise you to pick your technology providers very, very carefully. I think your success uh, is dependent on the, on the partners you pick. And if you can pick a true partner, not just a provider, but a partner, you, your, your chances of success will be much better. Uh, and once you go cloud, you need to be careful because it's hard to back back out. If you, if you go cloud and you dismantle your own premise staff, you dismantle your own premise uh, hardware, it's hard to go back. So you, you need to be very, very careful on that. And I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying be careful as you do it. Uh, but, but think long term, especially on negotiations, because you think about it, you move to the cloud, that's a very long commitment to that provider. And if you don't have your negotiations where you have cost protection ongoing, at some point in time, you could have a, a, a bad story with them. So uh, very briefly, because again, we're, we're almost out of time, give us your advice on negotiations since you, since you brought that up. Well, I think, you know, if you don't ask, you're not going to get it. And I think having a good partner who wants you to be successful and they want to be successful is a big, big step. If you have a partner that they're just in it for, to get every dollar out of you they can, then that's, that can be a concern. You, that should be a red flag that goes up for you. But if they are truly wanting a long-term partnership with you, then they should be willing to put something in the contract that will protect you and give you predictability going forward, especially in a cloud environment, because you are very dependent on them, more so than you are if you've got hardware and software in your data center, because you can fire them and get a third party to take care of it. But if you're in a cloud environment, you can't fire them unless you move completely away from them. So there's a, a closeness that ends up happening between the cloud vendor and the customer that doesn't happen with on-premise is what you're saying. I think it's a necessity that we're seeing and, and that we're feeling. Uh, you know, a lot of our technology on-premise providers are just that, they're, they're providers, but our, our true partners for the most part are in, the, in our SaaS environment. And that's out of necessity because we're completely in bed with them. I mean, we're committed to them, they're committed to us, and that's a very hard partnership to undo. Okay, well, this has been really quite, uh, quite a glimpse inside a changing and evolving manufacturing business. We've been talking with Roddy McCaig, who is the CIO of Shaw Industries. And Roddy, thank you very much for taking time to talk with us today. You're very welcome. I appreciate you inviting me. Next week, no, let me take that back. On this coming Friday, our guest on episode number 179 is Michelle Dennedy, who is the Chief Privacy Officer of Cisco Systems. So join us on Friday. And a big thank you to NetSuite for sponsoring this show and and also a thank you to livestream our video distribution partner thanks so much everybody and we will see you on friday